Good afternoon. My name is Amy Kaji. Thank you for having me. Um, I've been asked to introduce myself, so I'm going to uh, give you a little background as to why I'm the one doing this lecture. Um, I am an emergency physician by training. I work at Harbor UCLA, the county facility, facility, and I also work once a week as a community ER physician at Long Beach Memorial. After I did my emergency medicine residency at Harbor, uh, it was 2002, right after September 11th, 2001, when there was a lot of grant funding available for research fellowships and preparedness training. And at that time, I decided to pursue an MPH in uh, epidemiology at the UCLA School of Public Health. There I studied disaster preparedness, and then I went on to get a PhD in epidemiology, um, all to enhance disaster preparedness and to better understand how we can be better prepared in the county. Um, my thesis in public health was about hospital disaster preparedness, and what I did was I went to 43 hospitals in L.A. County, uh, went on site to all the hospitals, conducted a survey, looked at the types of equipment and supplies each of the hospitals had, and compiled them uh, in a survey. And then I also observed disaster drills at various hospitals and see, to see what kind of information could be garnered from that. Today's topic is disaster triage, and I just want to thank Dr. Zoraster, who's sitting right here in the front, who um, is the director of the Hospital Preparedness Program, and he gave me some valuable feedback and gave me some ideas as to um, interest all of you. So the lecture objectives today will be to introduce disaster mass casualty triage concepts, uh, to help you understand that priority will be on stabilizing patients first and foremost rather than actually healing them when you're seeing these patients. To also have you understand that you may be asked if you're in a disaster situation to perform care outside your normal scope of practice. So even if you normally don't care for kids, you may be asked to care for kids. There will also be an emphasis on improvisation of your skills and what you may be asked to do in flexibility rather than in-depth knowledge of care of the disaster topic. Uh, finally, you will note that decisions will be made with limited information in the aftermath of a disaster. So you may not have much information about the patients, you may not know their name, you, you may not know their medical history, etc. And we'll discuss some of the legal implications of doing so. So September 11, 2001 kind of changed the whole paradigm of disaster preparedness. This is when we realized as a nation that um, there are a lot of gaps in our ability to care for mass casualty incidents. These three examples that I'll provide, September 11th, Madrid bombing, and the London bombings, uh, are all examples how, of how hospitals dealt with an influx of victims. Um, so at 8.46 on September 11th, the American Airlines Flight 11 hit One World Trade Center North Tower. And then at 9.05, United Airlines hit one, 175 hit the South Tower. St. Vincent's, which is the major hospital in downtown Manhattan, uh, basically received almost all the victims. Uh, and at that time, when they were expecting all these victims, they had to think very rapidly uh, as to how they would make the space and how they would accommodate for all these incoming victims that they were expecting. Uh, so what they did, um, they are a level one trauma center and they have 500 beds, but they canceled all their elective surgeries, which is part of most hospital disaster plans. Um, they rapidly moved 15 ICU patients to the floors and they made 73 additional beds. How did they do so? They made beds in places that they normally don't care for these patients. So the PACU beds were made available for uh, patients. The ambulatory surgery unit was open for patients. The hemodialysis unit, they canceled their normal hemodialysis patients and they made room for uh, hospital patients. The endoscopy suite was prepared. And the cath lab, you know, you could hold some patients there as well. By 9.05, there was an ER physician and a nurse at every single bedside of the department. And the emergency department regist registered 426 patients on the first day 
plus 248 were seen in the adjacent eyewash facility. That's a massive number of victims. It's actually estimated that over 800 victims were cared for, some without documentation, um, were seen that day. So quite a lot. And they admitted 78 patients. They also had established a family center next to the ED because there will be issues of family reunification after any type of disaster. The second one uh, incident, Madrid, Spain, the September 11th for Spain, basically, uh, occurred on March 11th, 2004. This is pretty amazing. Uh, so at 7.39, 10 bombs uh, went off in commuter trains. 177 were killed. Over 2,000 were injured. This one hospital, it is an 1,800-bed teaching hospital, mind you, but um, they saw an amazing number of patients. They canceled all their surgeries just like they did in Manhattan. They discharged 161 patients in under two hours. That's a massive number. And at 7.30, there were 123 patients in the emergency department, and two hours later, there were only 10. They canceled all their elective diagnostic procedures. They opened their recovery rooms um, as potential ICUs, and they also established an information center. They saw 312 patients, and they hospitalized 91. The third incident, the London bombing in 2005. This is their 9-11. Uh, at 8.50 on July 7th, three bombs went off on commuter trains. At 9.47, another bomb went on, off on a commuter bus. 56 were killed at once. 775 were injured. At the one major hospital that bore most of the patients, this is a 675-bed six, hospital with a large ED volume, 120,000 per year, and it is a trauma center. But um, at this time, when the incident actually occurred, six ORs were already running. So what do you do with the patients that are on the table? Um, amazingly enough, they were able to clear the surgical operating suites within two hours. They also moved their ICU patients to the floors, the ones that they could, could um, vented patients in the ICU or transferred out. They decided at that time that they would only do the studies that were immediately necessary, so head CTs they thought were critically necessary, so they did head CTs. Rather than doing body CT scans or chest CT scans, they decided that they would just do a bedside ultrasound or a fast scan. And initially, they determined that only damage control surgery would be performed rather than actually fixing the problem in the operating room, which would take several hours. And they used uh, over 130 units of blood. On that date, they saw 194 patients, and 27 were considered seriously injured. So mass casualty triage, obviously, is a critical skill. Um, at some point, one of our hospitals will receive an influx of victims. The historical concept of triage actually resulted from the need of militaries to efficiently treat multiple ba battlefield casualties. So it's a military concept. Triage actually occurs at different times, and it's performed by different types of hospital personnel or uh, healthcare personnel. So um, in the field, paramedics do triage. They decide who needs to go to a trauma center, who needs to go to a STEMI receiving center, et cetera. In the emergency department, the triage nurse or the ED nurse gets to decide which patient goes back next to the, um, most, the next open treatment room, who gets seen by the physician first. And the ER doctor, if there are only, there's only one ICU bed remaining, we're the ones who kind of triage and decide which patient who's boarding in the emergency department for several hours to days gets the next ICU bed. So when and why is triage necessary? Triage, which is defined as a sorting of patients um, for treatment, is necessary if there's resource scarcity. Triage is also necessary then during a disaster, which is defined as uh, when the destructive effects of natural man-made forces overwhelm the ability of a given area or community to meet the demands for health care. That's an ASAP definition or American College of Emergency Physicians definition. Basically when the resources outstrip your supplies. So Hurricane Katrina, the Haitian earthquake, 
the H1N1 pandemic, all these are examples of the need to steward scarce resources. But how does disaster triage differ from daily triage? <clears throat> I kind of consider this like a different points on a continuum. So you can compare triage in the ED, which when you compare it to a disaster scenario, it's resource rich versus disaster where there's total chaos and there are scarce resources. The continuum is basically based on the amount of resources that you have um, to the number of patients who must be valued and treated simultaneously. How else does it differ? So during a disaster mass casualty incident, decisions have to be made much more quickly. Uh, and obviously there's less information upon which you're going to be making these decisions to care for patients. And unfortunately, for example, uh, if you're caring for patients in the emergency department, normally during daily triage, we have the luxury of getting the paramedic run or the paramedic report about what types of patients we will be receiving. In a disaster situation, we say that the majority of patients self-transport or 80% self-transport. So they will bypass EMS and we will not have the luxury of receiving a pre-hospital care report or an EMS report. So we don't have this information and we will be caring for patients we know nothing about. There's also a principle in disaster medicine. We always say we want to do the greatest good for the greatest number. And so the emphasis shifts from doing the greatest good for one individual to the greatest good for the greatest number. And um, therefore, ethical principles come into play. And whereas in a daily situation, we're thinking about who gets the next ventilator next, not who will ever get a ventilator. In a disaster situation, it's basically, will they ever get a ventilator? Will they ever get blood? Finally, the consequences of the decisions that you make during disaster mass casualty triage differs in that probably the consequences are far greater. You're going to be making decisions like, what patient should you treat next? The moderately injured patient with severe bleeding who could bleed to death? Or the one with an unprotected airway? Or are you going to con continue to administer blood to this patient when there's only 10 more units of blood left? And which of these victims should be taken to the OR, if at all? And who will receive the last remaining ventilator? So one other aspect of disaster triage. So during a daily triage in the emergency department, the nurse does the triage. In disaster triage, we want the most experienced physician leader who's equipped to care for these patients to do triage, ideally. If it is a trauma incident that involves lots of surgical patients, then ideally you want a surgeon to determine who needs to go to the OR right away, who doesn't. There are several types of disaster triage systems that are well published in the literature. Uh, they are all field triage systems. Uh, and unfortunately, none of them uh, have been validated in terms of how well they function in a real situation. So there are 10. And two are pediatric specific. Uh, what's been found is that there's really very little consistency in which system is used from one jurisdiction to the next all across the United States. So most of these triage systems use a four or five category scheme based on physiological criteria, and most use respirations, perfusion, and mental status. Those are the three criteria. However, they vary in how they measure these uh, physiological criteria like respirations or perfusion. Some may measure cap refill, and other may measure blood pressure, et cetera. <coughs> Again, none of these are validated. So you can imagine why these aren't validated. Uh, so one of the criteria for one system says that respirations greater than 30 is a criteria to make someone uh, a high level triage category. But very few nurses or physicians are patient enough to measure someone's respirations up to 30. So you can imagine how there's some reliability issues as well as some validity issues. Most of these triage systems are based upon global sorting. So you want to basically begin to identify who is least injured. And one of the best ways to do that is to see who is ambulatory. And the reason for that is if someone is ambulatory, 
they're mentating, they're perfusing their brain, they have good perfusion uh, to their extremities as well because they can ambulate. And they're likely uh, to be able to follow other commands as well. So we'll review two triage systems. One is simple triage and rapid treatment, and then there's a pediatric version of that called Jumpstart. Uh, in the handout in the back, there's a schematic of the Jumpstart, but I'll just briefly review Start for us. Uh, and then there's another one called Salt that I'll review. And there are several others, as I mentioned. There are eight others that are listed here. And the reason why I wanted to give an example for Start is because this is what is used in Los Angeles. So the mnemonic or the acronym stands for Simple Triage and Rapid Treatment, or Start. And it's based upon four triage categories. Uh, the first is immediate, and these are the most severely injured. It's red, and it's based upon respirations greater than 30, they have no radial pulse, or they have an altered mental status. Delays are yellows, and basically these patients need a gurney, but they're not actually an immediate patient. Minor patients are green. These patients can ambulate independently. They're mentating, they're perfusing. They have minor injuries for which they may not even need to seek care for the next days or weeks. And then deceased or expectant, these are black patients. Um, basically, these are patients after which you perform a head tilt or a jaw thrust, and they have no respirations, they're apneic, and so there's no use in expending a lot of resources in resuscitating this person. So some examples of triage categories. Immediate would be someone with an airway problem or even someone with a tension pneumothorax. If you performed a simple needle thoracostomy, you could alleviate that, and it wouldn't be so difficult to... Um, resuscitate them. An example of a delayed patient would be someone with a fracture or a large hematoma even, um, minor burns as well. Minor patients are basically those with minor lacerations, contusions, abrasions, etc., uh, that may not need care at all. And then expectant or dead patients are, are those with obvious severe burns, those in cardiac arrest, or those with severe head injury. Okay, so uh, how does this work? In START, they would, if you can imagine a mass casualty situation in the field, um, there would be someone out there, a triage officer, who would say, anyone who can walk, walk over here. So someone's gonna move the walking wounded. Those patients would be labeled minor. Um, the next patients would be, if no one has, a, if someone does not have a, any respirations after a head tilt and a jaw thrust, those patients would be labeled expectant. Those patients who are breathing rapidly with a respiratory rate greater than 30 would be labeled immediate. Those patients without a radial pulse or a cap refill greater than two seconds would also be labeled immediate. And patients who are unable to perform simple commands would also be labeled immediate. If they have stable respiration, perfusion, and mental status, they would be labeled a delayed patient. You can see how this is a little bit complicated and why this is not a validated system and the reliability would have some issues. So this start was used in the Metrolink crash in 2008. I don't know if you guys remember, but uh, this occurred in Chatsworth. The number dead were 25. There are 135 injured. And one of my friends actually, uh, Chris Kahn, studied this retrospectively to see how well um, these patients were triaged using START. So they found, retrospectively, that using START, they, 64 patients had been triaged correctly, or a little under half. Uh, 65 were over triaged, or nearly half were over triaged, and 2% were under triaged, which isn't bad. You know, ideally, you want people to be over triaged rather than under triaged, which is the principle in trauma triage as well. Um, another study, actually, of uh, 1,144 trauma patients using START demonstrated a relatively good sensitivity and specificity. So the numbers are somewhat all over the place, 85% and 85% sensitivity and specificity. So the reason why SALT was developed, that's not another system called the Na SALT National Triage Guidelines, is because there was so much variability across the U.S. in what triage system was being used. They 
depend upon global sorting, followed by individual assessment, then performing any life-saving interventions if needed, and then treating or transferring the patient. Intuitively, this makes sense to me. Uh, the first step is to actually do a global sorting. So um, you are going to make that big announcement, anyone able to walk, walk over here. And so those people, that category of patients would be treated or assessed last. Then you would say, anyone able to wave? You know, they may have a leg injury. And those people would be assessed second to last. The people who remain, they're lying injured, would be the patients that you would want to assess first because they may have some type of life-threatening injury. So in your assessment, you are going to be performing life-saving interventions that can be quickly performed. So control of major hemorrhage with point pressure would be an example, opening an airway with a jaw thrust or a head tilt, uh, doing chest decompression with a needle thoracostomy, um, or if it's a nerve agent exposure, would be an auto-injector antidote. The next step would be to say, is this patient breathing? If they're not and they're apneic, they would be labeled expectant and no other resuscitative measures would be performed. If they are breathing, then you go on to this next box, which is, do they obey commands? Do they make purposeful movements? Do they have a peripheral pulse? Are they not in respiratory distress? And is major hemorrhage controlled? If all those answers are yes, then you go to treatment or transport. If they have minor injuries, they would be minimal patients or minor patients. And if they're more than minor, they would be declared delayed. Finally, if they have none of these and you don't think that the patient is likely to survive, they would be labeled expectant. However, if you think that the patient could be viable given the resources that you have at that very moment, they would be labeled an immediate. So one of the principles that is emphasized in disaster triage is that um, you're going to be stabilizing these patients rather than actually treating them. For example, with the person with the tension pneumothorax, you will be stabilizing them, meaning that you will be performing a needle thoracostomy. You may not be the one to be doing the tube thoracostomy and ho hooking that tube to suction. So immediately, you're just going to be stabilizing patients you're going to be applying point pressure to hemorrhage. This idea about stabilizing also extends towards surgery as well. So if there are a lot of tra traumatic surger surgical issues, then you don't want one patient taking up 18 hours of your operating room time. So the emphasis will be, again, on damage control surgery. You're going to go in, they're going to stop the bleeding, they're going to pack the abdomen, and then they're going to come out, they're going to go to the ICU.